podcast. As always, thank you guys for listening and watching, and please go hit that like and subscribe button wherever you get your show. So today, before we kick it off with our guests, let's dive into the Patreon question of the day, which is, okay, so you know how everybody's got those weird smells that you like, you, you kind of like the smell of gasoline or chlorine or something like that. Like something you're not supposed to like, yeah, but you yeah. do like? Okay. So what's your favorite <laughs> weird That's smell? That's a good question. That's a good question. Everybody's got one of those, right? Yeah, you know, it's 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 quite interesting. I think both of those that you said are two things that <laughs> I love. Yeah. I love the smell of chlorine and I think it's just because I spent, a, you know, most of my life in the pools, mm -hmm. you know, obviously before getting into the ocean, uh, but then, you know, being in the SEAL teams for as long as I have and in the back, you know, riding those motors and you know, those 55s and 35s consistently back in the 90s. I mean, I love that smell. Mm. And the other one I think yeah. I like is the smell of burning trash. Oh gosh. Don't ask me why, but it takes me back to all of Southwest. What? Yeah, Here's no. why. Okay, explain that. So, hold on, you, yeah. You spend a lot of time in Southwest Asia, right? You know, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, which I did throughout the 90s. And then I was a country actions officer there as well from 2010 to 12. And so, whenever I smell burning trash, it brings me back to that. Mm. But then after going down range and also burning the I trash. I was going to say, wait a minute. It did a little bit of both. So now it mixed them both. So now when I smell burning trash, it'll take me into some combat times I'll be thinking about. But then other times it takes me into those times when I was running around like Bro, Sri we Lanka or Maldives. or yeah. We were in Iraq. That burning trash was, was everywhere. It was the worst. That's, you dug that? Yeah, man. I don't oh, know. No, I couldn't, I couldn't. Yeah, so if yeah. I smell it now, man, it just, you know, I get the flashbacks of, <laughs> you know, just like down, down Volusia or something, you know, running over the trashy areas where it smells. Just What's yours? Yeah. I would probably say one of mine is whenever you open a fresh can of tennis balls. So oh, good. Yeah. That is the best. <laughs> when do you also, play tennis? That's, that's we play tennis thing. all the time. I said, there you go. That, I mean, that is a great one. That's a good yeah, one. Yeah. It's good. Cool. I mean, it's one of the best smells. And then also uh, freshly shot gun, uh, gun shell cases. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. probably Absolutely. mine. Yeah, I have too many, man. I'm old. So yeah. I mean, there's just a ton. I'll have to go with the. What about you, John? Um. I don't know the the spent shells definitely gets me mm. and i like i don't know something about a skunk like just kind of <laughs> no. to go chase i was not expecting you to no. say that dude that's the most hardcore yeah i don't know so it smelled it so here's what's funny so you know nash was four years old when we got to hawaii Rhea was maybe eight months and then my two others were born there yeah. there's no skunks on Oahu. So it wasn't can until we came to Texas yeah. that they smelled a skunk. They're everywhere. Here, 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 yeah, we got and they're like, they're what everywhere. is that? And I'm like, yeah. that's a skunk. And they're like, what's a skunk? Oh and then I had gosh. to remind myself, you know, they've never seen one. They don't have yeah. them in Texas or that, they don't have them in Hawaii. That is so funny. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. I think mine, which I wouldn't have thought about it until you said it, but the spent shells, especially mm. if I'm doing well on the range. I, when it's cold outside? Yeah, yeah. like mm -hmm. that is a really good yeah. smell. Yeah, I think I have too many. Uh, I used to love the smell of the rodeo arena. Is probably mine. Yeah. Like the, with Ooh, the horse barn, the yeah. horse barn, the newer and I have yeah, the tack and all that mixed together. I got weird one. ones. I think that yeah. the tennis ball one is the best smell out there. So <laughs> when my when my when my kids were just babies, you know, and you were holding them and you kind of so oh. new baby smells great. Oh. Yeah, but I mean, it's just like brings back so many. I love. You it can't replicate that either. Not you a can't. smell. Yeah. Like it's like new car. Well, it's like a yeah. New car smell. Yeah, babies. There's a couple things down here. When you get when you when it hits you, you're like, oh, I know. Exactly and not only what that, that is. and not only that, it's specific to your child. Yeah. You know, and it's that you know it goes back to that primal. That's primal. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you're like, and if you see another kid and you're holding their baby, you're like. Mm. Yeah. You know, but if it's yours, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but if it's yours, you know. But it's then that it primal. changes too when you have a kid. Yeah. I, I've noticed that now. Like other people's kids, when they're screaming or yelling or something happens, I'm I'm actually worried about what's going to go. Yeah, I, I saw whole, that with you. Like thing. when my kids were here too. Yeah, I, I keep yeah. a watch. Matter of fact, we were asking some of the guys in the crew, <laughs> who who do you think's get who, who who gets treated better? I was like, my kids or my buddy's kids? It's like my buddy's kids because I won't let anything happen to them. Right? Yeah. I may yeah. spoil them. Yeah. But damn it, I keep an eye on them like you can't believe. Well, I think it's interesting too. As a father, you know, you want your your sons to be very independent. You know, and then the it's hard. and yeah, then as a yeah, mother, yeah. you know, you want to raise your daughters. But what I find interesting is, 
you know, husbands are a lot stronger on their boys where his moms are like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. But then if you flip the coin, moms are a lot harder on girls. Mm -hmm. And then as a father, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa what, are you, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, when it comes it's like, to this, interest, same way. It's like this dichotomy of, you know, and then you have those conversations. You're like, excuse me. I'm raising my boys. Yeah. And then, you know, you sh and, then, and then, of course, the wife. The whole demeanor I'm raising changes. My, I'm raising my girls. Yeah, the you whole know, demeanor so changes. Absolutely. The, a whole persona comes oh, up. Absolutely. And then they step in and you're just like. Well, you got to remember this yeah. because the reality is, is the first love of your daughter is the father. Right? Because that's the reality. That she's going to judge everybody else off of you. Oh, yeah. And so that's why it's so important for fathers, you know, to be prevalent in, in the girls' lives and, and vice versa for the boys. Yeah. Which is super important. Yeah, and if you're a shitty dad or abusive mm -hmm. to the mom, the Causes girl is going to think that that's normal Absolutely. and go and be okay in those situations. Yeah. And, and I, that's why it just it's so important, to, you know, to have that mm -hmm. that faith and that foundation and that biblical, you know, yeah. part of your lives in there, which is awesome. Yeah, I feel like being a Navy SEAL is a lifelong process. It is a lifelong. I, I think that going through thirty buds, years, of yeah, like process. going to going to buds and getting into the teams <laughs> yeah. and then getting to do everything that we did is part of the training. Absolutely. And then we're now we're really getting into the job. It's kind of like well, you know, talking about it took yeah, all of that, that to what, get here. What was the guy's name? There's a there's a show where Van Diesel, you know, he plays a oh the pacifier. Na yeah, pacifier plays a Navy SEAL and then he calls best he Navy SEAL movie ever. <laughs> right, right up with Charlie right? Sheen, Navy SEALs. <laughs> Vin Diesel, <laughs> that taught me a lot. That's what he was like, yeah. He had a, he a lot, a lot of great <laughs> one-liners from, from the Diesel, right? I, I love That's that funny. guy. He's awesome. Yeah. Dude, when's the last time you've seen that? It's been a while oh, for me. Oh, it's but... been 15 or so okay, years. Okay, so we were in Maine the other day, and I had to drive a minivan. Uh-huh. I had to upgrade. Don't look at me like that, man. I got kids. My wife has a minivan. I, I, what are you talking about? That's all right. That's the first thing I picked up was a minivan. <laughs> it was actually a Humvee, yeah. and I did, it said minivan on the thing. but. Um, <laughs> I immediately went to that whole thing. I was trying to spin into the parallel park job yeah, yeah. and the whole deal. We had the kids. It was, it was a good time. But so well. getting into you, you were a SEAL for thirty years, right? Yeah. You did thirty years. What buds class number were you? So I was one ninety one. So graduated January ninety four. Ninety four. Yeah. So that's that's right out of high school? high school. No, I did a couple of years of traveling. So I joined the Navy in I want to say October of 91 but I was on the delayed entry program for a little bit so they didn't have I was talking with JJ about this the other day man the dive fair program was they we did came, we, we came in on that because I was at the end of that and then the seal challenge program, right I'm so sure. we had dive companies mm. so I went through so I was in a I was in a I want to say it's either I think it was an I company in boot camp we had Male and female. Oh, you Morgan then, was in one of those. It was in Florida, and then you separated at night. And so what I was doing, I was the, I was the master at arms, and so I would get up early in the morning at three. I would go do the PT with the seals, right, um, and then I would come back, then meet with my class, and then take them. So I was doing double PTs in the morning. So I was running, which is good boot camp, right? It was great. I mean, I I went in pretty heavy, and I came out pretty trimmed up and ready to go for for buds. Went to A school, Where? but it was I went to A school in Where? Pensacola. Because because uh, all this has changed now. So back in the day, right, back so in I the nineteen hundreds, when we came in, <laughs> you understand me? <laughs> well, I went into I went I was uh, so I was a photographer's mate. <laughs> so I went to that's, Pens so I went to Pensacola that's, for that's Intel, awesome, right? Yeah. And it was quite funny because the uh, the E six that was there, which was our kind of like the guy that guided us, he was he was a team guy that lost his bird. Got into some serious. So, have role. you checked that out? Or you, that's legit. No, yeah, it's legit. And uh, so, anyway, he was the one that kind of got all of us that wanted to go to buds and trained us every morning and everything like. So you that. had to go and what was your recruiter? Was he a team guy or was it some dude? So no, I was very fortunate. So I grew up uh, in Imperial Beach, California, and I grew up kind of in the little area right now where you know the SEAL teams are, mm -hmm. right? So my grandfather it was quite interesting. For many years, I kind of wondered, like, how did I get there? My grandfather was very quiet, but my grandfather was actually the very last CO of the elephant cage in 1960. What's that? So the elephant cage is where the SEAL teams are now. So it oh. used to be it used to be the telecommunication. It's where the crypto school was. So my grandfather was- You know the rumors that swirled about what that dang thing was for the longest time, man. Yeah, uh, that's crypto. I didn't know that your granddad ran that. That's cool, man. Right. So the very first house that you come into IV in, which is a two-story house, 
that was my grandfather's house, and he actually used to have a gate, and he would just walk through the gate and go to work. What? Right. So mm -hmm. were that were the military? Was yeah. your Grandpa military? Yeah. yeah. So he, yeah, he retired a lieutenant commander. That's right. He had what was, was he even, UDT or no 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 no. So my grandfather came in. He was a cryptologist, and so he made it all the way up to chief, and you know he was, uh, and then from chief he commissioned, and then his crew were the guys that were like very, really instrumental. So he was what's called the on the roof gang, and there was a, a certain amount. He was the original crew that was on the roof gang, and those were all the cryptologists. You know during the war, his group was very instrumental in breaking the Japanese code during the war. He was also in Korea and so on, but he was a very quiet individual. And I didn't know that for many, many years. It wasn't until he passed away and I was actually in A school and my grandmother gives me a call and says, hey, make sure your whites are ready. Um, you know, they're naming the head cryptolog, well, they're naming a building after your grandfather. Mm -hmm. And it was quite funny because at this point in A school, I had a good friend of mine and we were always trying to get out of stuff. Like mm -hmm. we would always try to leave on early on Friday so we could go out and have fun. But anyway, so I told him and he's like, whatever and i was like okay well anyway about two hours later he comes in where are your whites i mean this guy's freaking out and i didn't know what was going on and he's like gotta get your whites together and that's when i found out you know their name in a building so i was there you know i think i had three little stripes on you know and i was around i rank and generals and yeah, their name in the head cryptological building after my grandfather come up the hall yeah so really that's cool. when i was like wow i didn't realize and that's why we were in imperial beach but because of that you know my next door neighbor was uh a guy by the name of Larry, he retired to CW04, was the very first SEAL to ever be asked to be a W5, but he decided not to because he had a GS position over at Bud's and ran ops. But anyway, he was my next door neighbor, and he was the one that really kind of saw something in me and that was kind of like, hey, you know, why don't you think about doing this, coming into the teams? And I'm, you know, I'd see him out there. He was on the experimental jump team, you know, and he was packing his parachute and doing some things. So we just started talking, you know, and then he was one of the guys that was a team guy. And then another guy by the name of Dave Jefferson was another one who uh, was instrumental. That was like when I was about 15 or 16 years old. But really it was more like from a leadership standpoint, it was really my grandfather. Mm -hmm. Because you know, I was raised by a single mom and uh, we, were, we were dirt poor. We didn't have a lot of money. Mom worked from like six o'clock in the morning to like six o'clock at night. And you remember back then it was just like, be home by seven. Mm -hmm. So I'd wake up in the morning and really my older brother Greg kind of raised me and then I would say when I was about 10 is when my grandfather was kind of like all right you're getting to that age where you need to have some leadership fundamentals and because he had such vast knowledge in the Navy and the military you know he's really kind of set me on the trajectory of really kind of thinking about military but at the time it was Larry Dave who kind of pushed me but then you know I had several different things that I wanted to do I wanted to go to college so I was doing that and then my mom passed away, and when she passed away, I was like, no, nope, I'm going in. And that's literally, she passed away, the next day I was at the recruiter's office. So you were a senior when she passed? I was 20 when she oh, passed away. Oh, you were 20, okay. Yeah. So I was, I think I was in my- What was he even out about? I mean, how did you did just, why the SEALs? Well, again, Larry was a team guy, and I met him when I was 10. And like I said, so I went outside- You just stayed on it? I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> So you know what I'm talking about? Like, what grabbed you that that to, to, that pushed you in as you saw something? I, I've been asking team guys that lately because it's usually so like one thing. Like, I saw this movie at this scene. So that was a lot of it, right? So then, as I was in high school, so I moved out when I was 15. Wow. So I moved out of my own when I was 15 years old, and then, um, you know, when I was in high school my senior year, I only had to take a couple classes because I had knocked out most of my classes early. I didn't have AP classes, but I got, I got rid of all the high classes. And, and Mar Vista, the high school that I went to, you know, we had, uh, uh, we lived next to the border of Mexico, so down in Tijuana. And so from an educational standpoint, it really, it really wasn't the best. So I just kind of superseded a lot of their academic stuff. And so I had two, two classes. And then my senior year, I did I had to take a math class, which I thought I finished. And so um, the guy who ran the chess club is just like, hey, just come in, I'll teach you chess. And so I basically, I had like a, an elective, I had a chess class, and then I swam for Mar Vista. So you're in the chess club? No, I just learned how to play chess. I'm basically, you're telling me you're in the chess club. I just learned how to play chess. <laughs> All right, man. Instead of going in and doing basic mathematics. You I know, this learned, is, this, what is this right here? So I'm very good at All chess. All right, so you came in, Bud's, so in, anyway, in what year? So I came in in 92, 
October of ninety two. I went to boot camp. The summer where? That was the my bud class. Yeah, when you showed up. My bud class was a so I almost I almost ramped into one ninety one, which was a winter class, but I'd only been there five days. And the one thing Larry told me Did you like, get in a hurry and try Oh I was gonna no, ask no, no. Larry's, ask Larry's right like, get in, be smart, learn all the things you're gonna need to learn. He's like, so if you, and it was interesting because he's like, if you show up and a class is about to class up, he's like, Don't do it. Yeah. And so I didn't. And so, you know, I, I waited for the next class and then went through the entire fourth phase, which was actually brutal. brutal. So fourth phase we, is the worst. So we lost almost half our class in fourth phase. So by the time we by the time we classed up for 191, I would say we lost maybe three guys in Hell Week, maybe four. Oh wow. That's but it? we but we lost a lot afterwards After? because of injuries. Oh, y'all got beat down. Yeah, well, I mean, we already went in really beat down and i think that just really took a lot of guys so we came out of second phase with half of that what was the harsh part for buds when you went through what you, you what got you the most so to be honest with you i was actually i didn't really have a difficult time in buds there we go <laughs> it's one of those guys, one of these guys. <laughs> i was one of those guys because he's older <laughs> than me one night well, no, 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 like, i didn't have a problem i never failed to run or swim matter of fact <laughs> now, i didn't even have to swim i was so fast so here was the interesting thing hey. right so i grew up in imperial beach and in IB, we surf the waters all year round with shorts. So if you had a wetsuit on, you were called a... Well, good for you, man. I'm so, glad that it wasn't hard. So <laughs> so I was used to the water wintertime and summertime, so it wasn't an issue. I ran and swam in high school, so that wasn't an issue. But why aren't all the guys in San Diego SEALs then? Why aren't all them To be honest them? with you, most of the guys that have gone into the SEALs from, from Mar Vista High School have done quite well. There's I've met four of them. Because you know as well as I do, the month of Pacific, she gets most. Yeah. The guys so what I will tell you is probably it was interesting because there was one moment where I was like, oh, my gosh, do I roll back or don't I? Because when I came out of Hell Week, on Wednesday I lost my socks. And so for Thursday and Friday, I had no socks on. I was just in boots. And it completely... Oh, you got the... Uh, so my entire... Yeah, yeah. So they ripped off all the entire Bottom bottoms side, of my feet, and they yeah. just looked like mince meat, right? Uh. And so when, when, when Monday came around, um, and I, I never really cared about what was happening next. I literally took every single evolution. Evolution, evolution. yeah. Right? So I, that's what I tell people to do. I had no idea that we had that kind of that work week, if you will, where you kind of did classes that week. You're talking about hydro hell week and all that stuff right with the charts yeah and so like here i am and i'm i can't walk and i'm like oh man if we're running and everything and then i remember going to the classroom and they're like yeah so this week you guys all just kind of get to calm down a little bit everybody gets to kind of relax you know we're going to keep you out of the water for a little bit and i'm like oh i'm going to be fine <laughs> but for that when i woke up that morning and i saw the butt on my feet i'm like oh man i don't, I don't think i'm going to be able to make it this week like i could barely walk but because you know we had that week to heal my feet my walk feet week. healed enough yeah, to yeah, walk week I yeah, remember, yeah. but after that i never and of course, once you make it through Hill Week, you know, you're really kind of like, it's at that point, it's either academic or, you know, you're going to make a oh, mistake yeah, in diving. On it's you. performance. Yeah, yeah, right, check. Right. And so I never really had. You don't know that when you're in there. No, you don't. When, and they'll, they'll tell you that, and, and the yeah. guys will tell you that. Like, who, who, I mean, you think you know everything by the time you get to a different phase, but yeah. in reality, it's, it's. And you were at SCVs. I think the reality is, too, is, is, and I was just talking to a gentleman who's, he just started, what's it, Tuesday or Wednesday? Monday. Monday. So he just started. He just started today. He started first phase today. So I was talking to him last week and I'm like, look, you know, I want you to have this type of mindset. You are going to be 10 times colder and 10 times more miserable than you're ever going to be in buds once you get out. And so they don't I, believe that. I know they don't. And neither did I. And probably neither I did didn't you. believe it either. And then you get out there and you're like, this is matter of fact, not only did I not believe it, I cussed him under my breath. I was like, you don't know a damn thing. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. And yeah. brother, yeah, being in the teams was t ten, oh, not yeah. twice as hard. Yeah. Ten and then times I also told him, I also that, told him, like, like you just said, I'm like one evolution at a time. One evolution at a time. Because it's going to end. Yeah. And then, you know, you're going to get a little bit of a break. Yeah. Get yourself set mindset wise and then move to the next evolution. I, the, the only way you get through is, is with that One crew you got. Yeah. Yep. With the guy. I mean, it, yeah. I'm talking about when we get older, too. Even the stuff yeah. that we do because of the camaraderie. Sure. I mean, it gives you a story to talk about when you're in the next evolution that sucks. Yeah. You're like, hey, remember that one time? And then you're like, oh, yeah, that one was real bad. I mean, you're in a moment that was it is miserable in itself, talking about a different one, laughing about it now. Right. Well, that's well, kind I think of like a good thing for life, though. Like, one evolution at a time and 
just there's always going to be sucky things but if you can get through it yeah i think one of the things that i was really so i was very fortunate i, I really caught on to things quick and so because i caught on th to things quick you know it was like okay i got that and i could just move on and i'm very good at multitasking so i can do a lot of things at once so when i got to team one and i remember getting into is that my, where you went first yeah i went to team one first and i got to my platoon Excuse me. and it was you know it was no fun one i got it yeah but steam too, no fun. But, but you know, it, it really kind <laughs> of built a, it built a it built a good foundation. And what was interesting was, you know, the first two platoons, I was very fortunate. I had you know some really good guys that kind of took me under my wing and mentored me. And that's kind of where who's I, your sea daddy? Will Spencer. Uh, oh, yeah, nice word. <laughs> so he was the one that, as a new guy, it was him. Will Spencer. It was Dave Ducazal, and it was. A guy by the I can't think of his last name um, off the top of my head. Ryan was another guy who was he was the air guy because I went in as air rep. Yeah. But Will was kind of like the way that he he kind of molded me was kind of like, you know, really be very focused in what you're doing. Think about what you do. Remember, it's we're a team and you're stronger as a team than you are individually. And so I kind of built that type of mentality. And so he they kind of honed me in on my skill sets, those first two platoons. And then my second two platoons and on, at that point, I just started mentoring individuals, right? Now, one could say that from, from a time perspective and what the kind of mentality was back then, I felt that I was mentoring correctly, but I can look back now and say I could have been. Oh, I don't do that. I could have uh, done uh, things yeah, a lot that's, better. That, that happens. To, that's part. That's a life. Right, thing. but, but I, yeah, that's you I know because that. as I as I commissioned and you know went into the yeah, yeah. training side and when I went over to SQT, you know I was, and when I started training, you know you guys and stuff like that, you know, I also found a, you know, just a fascination in watching you guys develop, and so for me that was great to see. And so when I was putting you guys all through SQT. At the time, I wasn't really thinking about, I'm going to deploy with all these guys. My job was just Okay, because I wanted to ask you that. So my job was to hone you in, make you the best that you could be. And so when you went to your team, I knew eventually I was going to go back to a team, but it was just when. Because when you guys came through, I was just starting out, right? Right, right. And so, you know. But that's different in our community because a lot of people will go through programs. They work, they're going to work with their instructors. They do now because everything is so... I'm, I'm talking about like in civilians and, oh, every, sure. and everywhere else. I mean, yeah, yeah. with us, you're going through with these guys. And, and when you assume a role, you assume it's identity. Sure. So you got to go into the instructor role. And then we look... I still call Spencer Calvin, Instructor Calvin. And oh, yeah. Getka, instructor Getka. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't break that habit. Yeah. Well, you know, it was interesting because... So the, the story goes like this. So I think I was, at the time, you know, STT was under the group. Oh, yeah. So when I got the in there, it was under the group, and it was only a two-year billet. And so I was there for about 18 months. And I just, at the time, you know, I still wanted to be connected to the team. So I'd always go over to Team 1, Team 5, talk to the Master Chiefs and everything. Well, when I first got to SQT, the Master Chief that was there at the time is now the Master Chief at SEAL Team 5. So I get over there, and I run into Ron Fosnock. Mm -hmm. And him and I start talking, and he is the, I want to say he was the LPO at the time. Or he was the chief of the platoon at the time. I can't recall. But he was like, hey, we have a man down. You know, we would love to get you over here. And the master chief just happened to be there. They start talking and I'm like, hey man, like I'm still at SQT. And at the time we had just went under the center. So now they wanted to extend it to three years. So now I'm like, well, I'm like, I think it's going under the center. I think I'm gonna have a, you know, a three year billet. So, you know, I've got some time, but I appreciate it. He's like, don't worry, man, we'll make some phone calls. I'm like, hey, hey, if you're gonna do that, let me get over there and at least, you know, have a conversation with, you know, um, Bruce Cuttingham and Mike Lou, right? Well, anyway, by the time I left SEAL Team 5 and drove over to SQT, which is not very far, the calls already happened. And so I walk in and both of them are sitting up on top and they're like, Lenny, get in here. So I get in there and they start ripping me up and I'm like, hey man, like I just went over there and they're like, you really wanna go there, is that what you wanna do? And they're like, yeah, and they're like, all right, well you go in there in three weeks. We're gonna let you go. And I went, like what? And so it was quite interesting, you know, and I think the very last class that I was there was, was with, uh, you know, the class, the first class that got their pins out of SQT. That was my brother. Is that your brother? Because that, in the combination, and when we're talking about SQT and STT, and yeah. the SEAL team has gone through phases. Sure. And, and, and implement and training. So 
it's more advanced. It, it moves, mm -hmm. I guess, I don't want to say more smoothly, but there's just a lot more integrated into what it is. And the old school guys, you, it's almost like a dawn of a new time. Sure. Like you'll, you'll hear old school guys say, I went through STT, SEAL Tactical Training. And then there's SQT, a SEAL Qualification Training. Right. My brother was the first one to get that. Yeah, I mean, when I came through the, you know, you, you got trained. You put at, me through. Well, you got trained at the team. At the team. And that's why, you know, I brought that up in another conversation was that's why it was like all of the West and East Coast teams, they couldn't work together. Because each team was independent. Yep. Each team had their own language. Yep. And we would deploy with SEAL Team 5, but we could not work with them. Yep. And our chiefs used to just... Matter of fact, they tried to put us together on a few times. It's, yeah. it's in the... I mean, this is history. And yeah. we don't do well. Yeah. But then, or we know, didn't. We didn't back then. Well, I think Force 21 was a big multiplier, right? And then the SQT when people started getting similar training. And then I think it was the timing was good because... Then the war came. War off, streamlines that, yeah. And then that streamlined it, and everybody was able to augment. We were augmenting okay, so damn neck. Where and were so you at during 9 11? So I was literally sitting in my bedroom when that happened. It was pretty early in the morning, and that happened, and I was like, all right, here we go. Where, where were you at? What team? So I can't remember if I was at a team at the time or if I was at. Because I remember running, our first appointment was in O. Oh, two in Iraq, in Baghdad. Yeah. Pretty well, we got there in 03. 03, excuse me, 03. Yeah. So we got there in April of 03. And you had come from, from where to go to five? So I came from SDT. Yeah, that's right. So I, like I said, I rolled over and then I got into that platoon, which was Echo Platoon. And I, you know, I did their, I didn't have to, I don't think I did land warfare. I went right into close core combat, CQC and all of that stuff, mount. And then we deployed. How many platoons have you done up to that point? Um, so that was my fifth. What? Really? Because I did four at SEAL Team One. They were all pay comp platoons. That doesn't. I'm talking. That's a. But that's still a lot of time. Over yeah, there. but I, yeah, but I did one of them was an augment. So I did you know three workups, four deployments. And then when and then we SEAL met Team Five, in, I did three. In, yeah, and it started in Kuwait. So we started in Kuwait, and then we did the push, and then our platoon, we were the first ones there, and then we did. So Dave, at the time, I'm not going to say any last names, but he started working with, um, you know, Scott, who unfortunately was one of the guys that ended up on the bridge. Mm. And so we started working with them doing, you know, looking for individuals and doing stuff like that and mass grave sites and things of that nature. And then it rolled into our first direct action mission. And so we were pretty fast. We were pretty quick. It's quite interesting. I mean, I remember it pretty clearly. We came in, and at the time, they didn't want to do any explosive breaching. So it was all mechanical. Explain so, that. Well, the reason why is because we were going in, the gentleman that we were going after was super high within. The, the difference between explosive and mechanical is explosive, and it is, is. So, you know, they're stair stepping, right? So, mechanical, you, st you start off basically with a sledge, and you can move up to. You know, chainsaw, quickie saw, whatever. Uh, we automatically knew it was either sledge and then right to quick. We're talking about getting into a building. That's what we're, what we're discussing. Yeah, we're right. just talking about entryway, yep. right? Mm -hmm. And so we went up through that process. And I, at the time, I was the number two man supposed to be going in the door. Another gentleman was the number one man. The guy was, you know, I mean, we were we were crushing the door. But again, we were in a very expensive neighborhood, so you know, we should have we should have been able to to breach because we kind of really put ourselves in a very not good situation because it was taking a long time because not only was the door massive but it also had locks on the back so our uh, our lead breacher was just going to town and he was not going to let me i had that quickie saw ready to go but he was like that is not going to happen on my watch so finally i was just about to hit that you know quickie saw and then he was like you know open so now i ended up being the first guy through the door and so the door's right there. Now we're in a small little hallway, and then now there's another door. But that door, you can see, it's kind of a foyer door. It's not as big as the front door. And as I'm sitting there, because we'd been there a while, the high-value target walks right past. Oh, my gosh. So I turn around. I do a donkey kick, knock the door. I come around the corner, and now he's right there. So it turns in, and instead of being high port on low port, it turns into a hand-to-hand. -hand. So now I'm just like, pop, you know, did the old fire hands to the face five or six times got him up against the wall and then basically just hip tossed him into the room and uh the aoic comes up gets him and then you know we lock him and then you know we clear the rest of the house we were in and out in 18 minutes 
with wow. the guy and everything we needed. And so from that point on, that was the starting point. And, and then it just got really busy. And then at the time, I think we had done somewhere of about 20 direct action missions. And then another crew came in. And that's when I met, you know, the big D for, you know, Drago and those guys. And when him and I met and, you know, we started working. How about together. that guy? Yeah, he's phenomenal. <laughs> How so, about that guy? Yeah, I mean, what a blessing to have him in our community. I, I, when you talk about yeah. teams, the best part, I'm just sitting here listening yeah. to you tell that story. But I'm thinking about all, everyone that was there. Yeah. And how if what I, just thank you, America. And, you know, for create for putting this guy, this gaggle together that fraternity and letting us run around it the way was. we did just to have those guys just the reaction of each one of those guys when when someone else would do something crazy <laughs> so the interesting thing is is like when you talk about time and place everybody that was supposed to be there in 03 was there Man. it was just it couldn't have been you couldn't have put anybody else in there it was just that's who needed to be there at that time and then again it was the same thing and our 0607 deployment. Well, I was going to ask you the yeah. difference between those two. We got, we got lucky as far as team guys go on deployments is when it's settling up for, I mean, I didn't make Fallujah. Chris made Fallujah. There was a couple of guys who made, yeah. we got some guys who made every battle. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were in the coolest and you got some guys who chase it. I mean, like, and that's a saying in the SEAL teams, man, you don't chase the war. It'll, it'll just kind of show up to I you. I think for it, me, it was more. So, I mean, I was the number one, number two man almost on every DA in that first deployment. And what, what was interesting, you know, this this came back years later when we talk about, you know, when I was getting ready to get out of the military, you know, and I was going through the whole process of the medical aspect and kind of getting my head straight, you know, to get out and, you know, unpeeling and getting in and having those conversations. You know, I went, I went through that mental aspect. The way that I did it was I worked with my psychologist, but I also worked with my, with my um, pastor. And the, what I did was I had them work together mm -hmm. because spiritually I was good it was the the world outside of that right they were not aligned right and so i always tell people i'm like you can be spiritually fine but the reality is the mind is quite an interesting thing right because your psyche is is going to get the best of you and when it what does it get the best of you it gets the best of you when you're sleeping mm -hmm. right so you can't control the things that happen in your head while you're sleeping and so as i started to really kind of unpack these things it was and I had this, it was such a, an incredible moment when I was sitting there having this conversation. And so when I did my very first, you know, op, when I had that hand-to-hand -hand combat, what I didn't realize was, as you're coming in and we're clearing the house, you have a group of individuals that have to separate people, right? And I remember as we were doing that, you know, the SAC teams, you know, they separate the families and the kids. Oh, yeah. And in my head, I see these kids just screaming right for their dad you know and i remember just clear as day you know the eyes the sobbing and i thought to myself really quickly i'm like you know this guy is probably the most terrible man in the world for all the things that he's done right and he should hold be held accountable but there's innocent victims in that mm -hmm. like he's probably one of the best fathers right you just don't know yeah. right and so what i ended up doing was i never wanted to be a part of that crew so i always made myself the number one or number two man I was on the breach team and you know I did those first four and obviously you know at that point the OIC was like yeah we're gonna keep him on there he's doing great and so I stayed on there and when people didn't want to do it I'm like I'll do it because I did not want to be so I put myself in it was a it was a moment of like I literally put myself in that fatal funnel every single time because I would rather get shot and have to shoot back than see these kids get separated from the families. Mm. what was the hardest thing on you when we were over? that was that that one that was really I mean of course, you know, I the guys that you lose is is horrible. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's, you know, we've lost a lot of guys. I've lost a lot as you, you know, we've lost really 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 close friends. And so that is very difficult, you know, but I worked through that process, you know, and it was the way that they did this is they have these threads. And the way that they work these threads is when you lose somebody, there's a connection right on how each individual is lost because it's in combat. It's either in a direct action or you're taking people down, firefight, you know, IAD, right? So you you work through that process and you, the two hardest ones, right? And then once you get through that one, you know, it each one becomes a little bit easier. And it was the same thing here. I had to go through all of these threads, right? And I remember 
The worst one was, you know, we blew a door. I remember going in and, you know, there's this little girl, you know, and she's, she's alive, but she's. You're talking about that, the legs there? She, no, no, she's just jacked up, yeah. right? And she's crying and she's all bloody. And I remember that one was very, very difficult, right? So that was my worst thread when it talked about the, you know, the separation of the kids, right? So I worked through that, worked through the other ones. And so, you know, by the time I, you know, fully got out of the military after 30 years, you know, my head was, my head was straight. Plus my faith on top of that was another factor as well, right? Yeah, but were you running with that the whole time? Your faith, was it on point the whole time? So it's quite interesting. So when we talk about that, my faith grew a little bit each deployment. Check. And I think, you know, that first one, you know, I don't know if you noticed, but every time that I came back, you know, it was, I was having a very difficult time because, you know, a lot of drinking, right? So I kind of was separating myself. But I think after that, really after that 06, 07 deployment, mm. I think that's where- That was I a hard one. It was a hard one. It was hard. And I think that's when I really started coming back to my faith. I came back and it was quite interesting because I was getting ready to ramp up to do another deployment at five. But, yeah. the, but the powers that be, because I had so, I'd never been on shore duty. Ever. So I had 17 years of sea duty. So I was getting ready to get ready. How that, because our schools are considered sea duty, right? Yeah. So SQT was sea duty. Sea duty, all right. Roger and that. so when I was sitting there, they're like, hey, you need to go to shore duty. And I'm like, no, you're, you're messing up my entire career path. Cause I was being groomed <laughs> by some I'm trying of, to do something right, here. Well, I was being groomed by, you know, some of the best master chiefs, you know, in NSW. And so, you know, this was going to hinder me from making master chief. Cause if you send me to buds, I'm not going to be in that leadership position. It's a three year billet. Then you got to fight for your position, which wouldn't have been an issue, but then that's another workup deployment, yeah. you know, so that would have been, very problematic. And so I remember having the conversation. I'm like, if you send me to Buds, because I had talked to several of my friends that were over at Damnick that were putting in warrant packages at the time. And so I remember them telling us, it was, uh, it was actually, um, he's no longer with us, but it was, um, uh, Brian was the, the, master, the force master chief at the time. And so I told him, I'm like, hey, if you send me to Buds, I'm putting a warrant package in. You know, I'm putting a warrant package in and uh, he's like, eh, sorry, man, you know, we got to send you over there. So I get over to third phase. I didn't want to be there. The master chief at the time was a good friend of mine. So I go and sit with him and he's like, Matt, we're going to put you into first phase. And I'm like, that is a horrible idea. <laughs> and he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm angry. I'm mad. And you're going to put me in a phase where, you know, right, right, I'm like, that's just a bad idea. So have you... <laughs> just real fast I somebody sent me the other day Mel and I went out to California to right. some of the older guys and they have you seen the 66 rules of being a, uh, a frog man yeah. by, by Casey Ryback I don't that's who we got him from but right. number 53 is if you get orders to STV or buds it says kill yourself <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I had to do shit. Hey, I'll minutes. send you yeah. these rules. I mean, I, yeah. every team guy, Definitely. if you don't have these, or 66 okay. of them, they're brilliant. And I'll that's probably, number I'll 53. Laugh. I'll probably laugh. It'll be a good laugh. Oh, it's so funny, man. Only team, team guys yeah. will get it, man, but it's full of those. So I told him, I was like, hey, I want to do, <laughs> do third phase because I was like, at that point, you know, the guys are proving themselves. I can mentor them, right? Which is what I did. And I was, you know, to be honest with you, I was very, I wouldn't say diplomatic, but like if you came in and you were a strong class, like I didn't hammer you. But if you were weak, then, you know, I would. Are most of the guys pissed off to get first phase duty? No, I think a lot of guys like it. They, they dig it? But for me, it just wasn't the right place, right time. Yeah. Well, and it was right after yeah, some it was, really hard And plus, play. back then, they didn't really and the have... Vietnam, the Storms and the Shields had the Vietnam guys, and they were yeah. well pissed off. Yeah. And I think also on top of that, they just, they did, at the time, there wasn't really a good way for guys like us to decompress. We didn't have nothing. We, just, we didn't have anything. And so, you know, third phase was, it took me about six months, then I decompressed, and then I, I literally, I put my warrant package So what's in. the thought process? Is that we decompress by sending us to third phase so we can shoot guns and blow stuff up? It's kind of like a detox for us? No, I but think- But not in a combat So scenario. to be honest with you, third phase was really kind of a, it was a, it was an unknown great place to be. I was, it is, right? It is. Okay. A lot of time off because you were sectioned and because there were so many flights going to and from 
San Clemente Island, the island. you didn't have to be out there for the whole five weeks. Oh, okay, check. So, you know, a group would go out, you'd fly out for your week, come back, go back at the end. All right, so the guys so you, you still good. had time, you know, that's you could good. go to school, you could do things. That's good. So I was able to spend a lot of time with Val, and that's really where, you know, I started my family, which was great. But at the time also, the, both the XO and the CO of Buds were both, you know, prior Mustangs. Yeah. And so I talked to both of them, and they're like, absolutely put it in, Matt. You know, Stephen Hour was the yeah. CEO at the time. He's like, put it in. And so I talked to my SCA at the time, which another funny story. But uh, so I talked to him, and he's like, yeah. And he's, but he, he was like, what are you doing? You know, because he was, he was on the Master Chief route, too. And he's like, how dare you? And, dit, 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 and all this other stuff. And of course, they gave me a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of heat for that. But anyway, I picked it up. And then because I didn't tell a lot of people, once I picked it up and people saw it, man, I didn't I didn't answer my phone for like two days because all the master chiefs were like, bro, what? Anyway, Think so right, anyway. Right, so right, what's right. the difference? I don't know the difference between a warrant. Package so a warrant and a officer in the Navy are actually a commissioned officer, right? And so from that point, there's two directions. Either you go from that point, you go to training, mm -hmm. right? Like OCS. No, 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 no. You just become on the training side of things. So you're really you kind of like I built. Teacher. Out, yeah, you know, like I, I built doctrine and, okay. you know, kind of just changed the whole way we do training okay. um, and implemented a lot of things, you know, not only in BUDS, you know, like I brought out, I took away a lot of the, some of the explosive stuff and brought in a lot of stuff we were doing down range, like. Which is beneficial after we came at, back from the war, too. Absolutely. It, it kind of it chewed a lot of that stuff out of there, right? Well, I mean, for example, I mean, I got there in third phase and we were doing Bangalore's. Yeah, well, and I'm like, what we is shouldn't, that? Bangalore's is just like a very long, anyway, it's like an old World War II day. And I'm like. We shouldn't be doing that. We should be doing loop charges, loophole charges, Explosives, three footers, C2. Things All right, like so that. when did you get sick? Oh, that was way early. That was in 1997. Yeah. What That's happened? a good story, though. Yeah, so it was quite interesting. So we this were. This is a team never quit moment right here. This is you, it almost, was. you almost died. So I like. Yeah, so we were overseas. And this kind of thing scares the hell out of people. Yeah. What happened to you? Yeah. Okay, tell us. You're gonna take me through know. this one. Okay, it's a great story. I it is. I mean, it's uh, it's, a, it's an interesting story. I'm not gonna get into some of the other parts. You know, let's just the, skim over real fast from the man. personal yeah, standpoint. Yeah. But so we were overseas, and at the time we were in Thailand. There's some things going on. I'm not gonna get into that. But uh, anyway, we were swimming across one of the rivers, and in the Philippines or in those areas. The rivers, you know, their nickname is SHIT River, right? Because mm -hmm. everybody utilizes them for a multitude of things, right? So, anyway, as we're swimming across this thing, I mean, I literally. F oh, God, this is the hardest part of the story. Yeah, so I felt <laughs> something slither down my throat, right? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I'm pretty sure it was, I'm pretty sure it was just a piece of feces, right? Oh, dude. And so I sat there and I was like, <laughs> I tried to spit it out, but you know, by that time it was too much. And so this is straight out of a movie. Just wait. So anyway, so I get back, and now we're back in Guam, and whatever's inside of me <laughs> is literally just festering, right? Oh, God. And so I mean, now like I'm back in the United States, and I'm about four days into being in the United States, and I wake up, and my entire like aliens. Yeah, like everything is just it's hard as a rock I can't breathe I can't walk upstairs and so I'm like something is wrong and so I check myself into Balboa dude this is unbelievable yeah I'll never forget this so man. I check myself into Balboa and they take my blood and they come back my white blood cell count was like 30 million six thousand I mean it's yeah, like crazy right if you get really really sick it's maybe like 10 so mine is like triple so they thought that I had something really bad so they put me in a room and they secure me and People are coming in, you know, and they're doing all of these things. And in the meantime, I'm literally just starting to strip away. And I'm like, what is happening? And so the process just keeps going. Uh, I went into renal failure. So they come in and they, you know, they're like, do we put them on dialysis? And they're like, no, let's just pump and fill it with IVs and see what happens. So they did that and thank goodness, you know, my kidneys came back online because that was kind of scary. I'm like, man, once you're on dialysis, I mean, that's it, right? And so that was kind of scary. And then they did a bone marrow biopsy. That came back negative. HIV, all of these other types of tests. And they couldn't figure out what was happening. Like and an episode of House, man. It's freaking... Yeah, and the whole time, I'm literally just deteriorating. Like, I mean, I went in probably... Well, I'll get into that, but I went in pretty heavy. I was probably about 2, 215, 220 at the time. And um, I remember I, I, I was probably about eight or nine days into it. And it was funny. So Chris shows up. And uh, 
there's two names and they had moved the guy out of the room that I was in. And so he comes in and I see his head, you know, kind of pops around the corner, kind of looks at me, you know, and looks at the name, looks at me again, walks back and he's like, hey, did you move Petty Officer Lennick? And they're like, no, nah, that's him. And he's like, oh, damn, yeah, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> and then he walks in, he's like, man, what's up, man? You look, you great. look great. And I'm like, I literally just yeah. heard you right yeah. outside, you know, talking <laughs> shit. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, so about, you know, the ninth or 10th day, you know, the doc comes in and what I love about, you know, military doctors, I just said, hey, you know, you gotta be straight with me. Like, what's going on? And he's like, look, we have a multitude of doctors working on you. We have no idea what's going on with you. And I'm like, okay, well, am I gonna die? And he goes, if you keep going like this, yes. So I'm like, okay. And I'm like, can you give me a minute? He's like, yeah, so I had a little bit of moment. And then he comes back in, I'm like, hey, just keep me comfortable then. And so then the next day a lady walks in and she's from the CDC and- Was she in a suit? Uh, I can't remember. Like a bubble suit? I, I, no, 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 that was in the beginning, that's yeah, so yeah, much yeah. in the end. Like by this time everything was like, you're good and everything like that. And so I'm sitting there, I'm like, we have, we think we know what you have. We have a medication. We've is this never hurting or are they, are they Oh, by this time, yeah, I'd already had my chest, chest tube. tube. Yeah, oh, my yeah. chest tube is in and all that stuff. Cause, oh yeah, I've got a chest tube, which is, I don't know if anybody's ever had one of those. The most painful thing. You get, it's basically you're gutted because they oh. can't give you anything. They can't do anything. It's the worst. In, cut, you know, put that thing in, crack your rib. And then they put that in, made a mistake. They do that. They had to rip it out. Pull it out and which, do it again. Which I have no lower lobe. Oh my god! Oh really? Took the, so you only got two on each side? So I have this one's fine. This one is gone. I didn't know that till really recently. But anyhow, but uh, let me get back to that. So I, I come back in. They give me the drugs. I have to sign these waivers just in case. Here, something. sign this. It's like there's nothing on there. There will case, be just in case something <laughs> starts growing and appendages start popping out. You know, but uh, yeah, that ended up you know kind of putting everything back on track. It ended up helping up somebody a little bit later on down the line who was in the same AO that got yeah, I something similar. That. But but yeah, I think by the time I left, and I mean, I was drinking five, six assures a day or every meal, you know, for like four days before I left. And I was probably about 125, maybe <gasps> 130 when I left. Oh my gosh. Jeez. So yeah. what did they say it was? They never really figured it out. It was just... It was some type of... Amoeba? Some it was some type of parasite. They just didn't know... Like drinking poo. Well, whatever was, it was inside. So it was whatever, whatever, you know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> but anyhow, yeah. Dude, so That's so hardcore, man. Yeah, <laughs> it was It was gnarly. And I mean, I couldn't, it took me about six months, you know, to get back to normal, maybe longer. But I remember I had to do pulmonary function tests consistently. And I was on the very last one. And the lady looks at me. She goes, if you don't pass this, like, you're med board. And I mean, I was like, <gasps> yeah, right. I mean, I was pushing as hard. <laughs> Everything face yeah. was about to pop out, you know, eyes were bulging. And I literally, there's a little line. And she goes, Pink. And she's like, you're good. And I'm like, <laughs> oh I literally God. passed out because I had no more air left. Yeah, yeah. And then they're like, well, hey, come back every year. And I was like, yeah, sounds good. <laughs> and so I, it was really, really interesting. So you talk about never quit. So I had to learn. So first I had to learn how to rebreathe because I wasn't functioning at full capacity. Was right? it feel like somebody's grabbed you around the chest? So what it is, and it's still to this day, like I'm on an inhaler and some other stuff now, but when I take a deep breath, I can only go to a certain level. Yeah, check. And so my left lung feels like it completely can still expand, but it can't. Right. But because of that, I learned how to rebreathe. So first it started out because I had to do, I had to go and do, I went right into combat swimmer. So after I was healed up. Of course you did. Good right. for you. Yep. Exactly where so we go. So now I'm kind of like. Stick his ass underwater. Right. So yeah. I stay at like nine feet. Mm. And I'm kind of like, okay. And then I would go a little deeper. And I'm testing because this thing has to close on its own. You can't, you right, know, there's right, no right, sutures. Yeah. It just heals. And you don't know if you're going to get bubbles in there. So I'm like, okay. So I was diving. So I'm like, okay, I'm good. Like diving's good. Then the next thing was jumping. <laughs> so now I'm like, okay, well, I want to go free fall. Just get it out of the way. So now I get up to there and I'm get up to there. I'm like, okay, yeah, there's. No pain, all right. jump out of airplanes, I'm like, okay, I'm go. right? You... And so then I had to learn how to rebreathe because when I ran, I couldn't take a full breath. So I learned how to shallow breathe. Shallow breathe, yeah. When I was swimming, I learned how to shallow breathe. So I've never been able to breathe the same since then. And it was funny because when I was getting out of the military and I was going through the process, I brought that up to my SMO and he goes, whoa. So he sends me over to Tripler in Hawaii and I go through all of these tests and the colonel that's put me through this test is like, okay, this is just really, really strange. He's like, why didn't you ever go back? And I'm like, because I didn't want to 
get booted out of the military. And he goes, so how long has it been? I'm like, well, I did an extra 20 years, so I would say that I'm good. You I know, don't know. <laughs> in combat 20 years? I'm like, I think I'm good, right? And so he gets me on the machine, and I mean, my inhalation and exhalation is, is horrible, right? And then he puts me up on the VO2, and I'm like, I go about, like my VO2 stops, and I go about another 10 minutes. And he's like, this is not normal. But it's because I learned how to read. Yeah, yeah. And so then they found, uh, which I got to go get another x-ray here shortly. I've got a, a five and a seven miller, seven millimeter, couple of uh, tumors in my right lung. But oh they're gosh. not sure if it's, you know, cancer or if it's just from all the scarring. Because, you know, over the years, technology's gotten better. And so if you just did a quick x-ray you wouldn't see it but because they're able to do all those 360 scans yeah, now, yeah they were able to find those so they could have they've probably been there forever so i got to go do another one they're going to figure out if it's grown then they'll do a biopsy but my god i just leave it up to the good lord crazy yeah so you know it's kind of funny but yeah the process of all of that you know and then getting out becoming an officer and then my my first trip you know i went over to southeast asia again or southwest asia and i ran Sri Lanka, Maldives, India, and several other countries while I was over there. And that was phenomenal because I learned a lot from that perspective. I was in embassies a lot. So, you know, I started going back to school, learning a lot about, you know, diplomacy uh, and several other courses that I went through because now I was sitting in front of very high ranking individuals. Mm -hmm. And so, as you well know, you go to different countries and you're at that capacity, anything you say or do you know, can be an international incident. And so, you know, I wanted to make sure that I was very solidified in having those discussions. Oh, that's not just a phrase. That's happened. All of our, I mean. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And so. Team guys are notorious for that. Well, what was great about it is at one point we were working with the Indian Navy. And, you know, we were doing this big, massive exercise with them. And it was it was quite interesting because we're sitting in there and we wanted to work with their special forces but it was very difficult because india is a very interesting country right they there's you have to go and meet with individuals you have to get you know everything has to get put in the minutes that you're going to train with them you know because they train with several different other and they don't want to act like they're you know partial to one or the other which is you know that's diplomacy 101 and so we're sitting and we go on to the main indian um boat and the commanding officer or the CEO of the was when it was either in our buds class or oh you we, had some of those right or we trained with him at some point because he sees me and he like out of nowhere they're talking everything's fine and then he's like Matthew oh my he's gosh. like when so we start talking and like he's like how have you been you know how is so and so and so and so and I'm like this is just incredible and so from that point on, I told him why, what was going on. Three weeks later, we were, you know, in India. And I'll tell you what, man, you don't think first. about it when we're going through yeah. that because of all the different people we get to interact with and work with. Sure. I mean, because they move on too. Yeah, partner nations. And well, it, and, and, and what's interesting and is- And what they become is acceptable. Well, they're like, they, they do similar. They, they're kind of like our, you know, they do their time and then they have to go up through right. the process. The difference between them is they don't stay in special operations like our officers do. They have to go up into the Indian fleet and they do all of those types of things, right? So it's a little bit of, of a different, you know, beast. But, you know, coming out from there, I said, hey, I'm going to do this deployment because it was an ass because Guam was a very, it was hard to get warrant officers out there, right? And to be able to run those AOs. And I said, okay, well, if I take that, then I want assaults at trade at one. And they're like, absolutely. And so I was able to do that. So I came back, did trade at assaults for a little while. Which is our training department and it's yeah, our assault is, teams. Is yeah, on the, west, on the West Coast. Sorry for people that don't know that. But what was even more interesting is the time the Admiral, which was Losi, he wanted to get back Great in the man. water. Wanted to get back in the water. And no one at Tradet had the skill sets that I had because team one was the water jungle team. So I'm sitting in there and I'm starting to hear the rumblings of, you know, I think they're going to, I think they're going to pull you over to Maritime. And I'm like, oh, I don't think so. Anyway, a couple days later, you know, the, the OIC of Trade Act pulls me into his office. He's like, Matt, I'm like, you're going to put me in there, aren't you? He's like, listen, <laughs> you know, it tries to, yes, he tries to yeah, sugarcoat it. But, yeah. but to be honest with you, I mean, again, God's timing. 
it was the perfect setup for me to get a lot of experience because even during that time, went out to SDV several times yeah. and it set me up for, you know, the next 10 years, nine, I'm sorry, nine years that I spent over in Hawaii. You finished up there. I did. Is that nine years? Well, I went over there. It was quite interesting. So <laughs> it's a funny story. So I was actually had a completely different assignment after I finished because I took maritime to the next level. I, I mean, I got rid of some of the guys and I brought in some extremely talent, uh, a lot of talent. Guys that had done real world over OTBs, a damn neck, guys that were taking real world takedowns, you know, overseas, you know, like Matt Rand and all of those guys. Yeah. So I brought in magnificent talent and I helped Bobby Hall out a lot because, you know, he was taking the blunt of it because he went over there and he was the SCA. And unfortunately, the person that was in there before me wasn't really. And, you know, we had a great crew. We had a good a good team of guys. And so you know, bringing in all that technology and taking it to the next level. We started off the 21st century frogman, which really took things to the next level. But you know, that's, that's what all of our guys, when we got back and, and not that the, I mean, the war has just ended, but yeah. most of the guys who came off the line, we had to rotate into something. They were yeah. rotating into making the, the community better. Stronger. Yeah, I think it was phenomenal. I think, you know, during that time frame, it was just, it, it took our organization to the next level. And it also took it to where anybody could work with anybody. You know the foundation. We do was, do that. The foundation was phenomenal. So you could have so many different people doing so many different things, but uh, I got recruited to go out to Hawaii to be the in, to be the OIC of Trade at Trade at Three. And so, but when I got out there, they had just shifted Group Three out to Hawaii, so they were minimally manned. And so the Commodore was a good buddy of mine at the time. He had different ideas, and so he, as I was doing the onboarding process, he's like, "Hey, Matt." I know you're out here to be the trade at, you know, OIC, but we don't have an N32. What's that mean? The N32 is a guy that runs all of the training mm. for all of NSW Group 3. It's like the N32 runs all the training from the group level and oversees all the trade ats, all the teams. It's the same thing, right? And so I said, okay, well, East Coast, West Coast, you got about eight or nine guys, right? And so I'm like, that sounds fantastic. You know, how many guys do I have, you know, under my command or how many guys am I gonna be running? And he goes, well, if you look in a mirror, there'll be two of you. Oh and I'm like, you get lonely, look in a mirror. <laughs> so I'm right, sitting here, so yeah, so I was like, okay, um, that's interesting, right? Because we're just building it. There's a lot of things that have to happen. And so I was very fortunate. There was a gentleman, he may have been there when you were there, Ian. Yeah. So, you know, he just happened to be in there and that guy had been in this community for quite some time. So he was really my saving grace. He was really my mentor. He kind of, he basically gave me about 10 years of undersea, you know, professional development in about six months. That's awesome. And I had to build out the entire training pipeline working with, you know, trade at, but I mean, I was like, I had to rebuild all the doctrine, you know, get, make sure everything was good. Cause they were really fundamentally, they were, they were training. <laughs> if something would have happened, a lot of people would have fried because they weren't really following a lot of the, the types of procedures that needed to be followed when you talk about from a war comm standpoint. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we brought in the N32, you know, I did a lot of great things there for four years, you know, changed kind of like how we were doing everything, you know, East Coast, West Coast, and then, you know, SDV Team 2 popped up, a lot of things were going on. And then after four years of that, the Commodore who came in, who again, was one of my greatest mentors, he was like, hey, I want you to be my trade at 3OIC. And so, the last three years, I was the trade at 3 OIC and, uh, you know, running all the training for the guys that were doing it during this massive restructure. So I got there and I kind of started some of the process as the N32. So rolling into the OIC was very simple. And so I came in and, you know, we were at that point, we divested of two massive organizations, Group 3, Group 10. And we started to build out Group 8. My job was to build out the entire training side of things. So not only were we building out trade at eight and we were East Coast, West Coast and Hawaii, because now we've got multitude of training pipelines everywhere, but also we were consuming the um, advanced training command. So we took over both the SDV schoolhouse, which had never been done because that is a NETC course, which is Naval Education Training, which is ran by the center. But myself and another warrant, we did all the legwork and I didn't see the fruition of it, but I did all that legwork to get that done. And by the time I left, I think I was retired for about 
maybe a couple months and I got a call from the incoming OIC and he's like, hey, we consumed it, great job. And so now we run both the schoolhouses on the east and west coast, which is the first time that an, ever an operational command has ever took control of a net team. That's so cool. Yeah, so it was it was great, it was good. I mean, I, was, I found my passion in mentorship and really, you know, building guys, because I had five or six guys, because I went through and got my bachelor's and master's while I was the OIC of trade at the same time, plus a ton of certifications. And so in that process, I pushed my guys and I had five or six guys get their bachelor's, multiple guys get their master's, a lot of guys going and getting like certifications and project management. Cause I was like, hey, you know, what you're doing now is great, but you want to get that education. You want you to set yourself up. Um, and that really set me, set me up for the job that I'm doing now. At, and so know. talk about, I mean, you did all these things in the SEAL teams over mm -hmm. a span of 30 years. Yeah. And you get out and it is hard to transition like yeah so for me i started transitioning in 2018. Mm -hmm. i knew there was a possibility that i was going to get out in 2022 right because if i made w5 yeah but the problem was is the calculation shifted so it used to be three to four or i'm sorry four to five was four years and then it shifted to five years and so i was like mm, so really it's like I would have had a look at September of my very last year and if I didn't make it then I was out in November. Are we going over time? No. Right. Okay. Right, when we, right. So yeah. I was uh so I was out in November. So I was like there's a possibility I'm not going to make W5. Mm -hmm. So in 2018 I got with my uncle Patrick who very smart individual and has been in the leadership development realm. I mean that guy ran some of the most incredible things and he was one of my biggest mentors when I when my grandfather died. He took over as my mentor when I was 18. Mm. And that guy has been my mentor throughout my entire life. He's been, he kind of became my father figure. And he's from Texas. That's how So yeah, he lives, he just here. lives a couple hours from here. But he spent the last, I mean, he, when he retired in 2010, before that, he was 15 years in South, or in, in Bahrain. Oh, wow. So he was working for Aramco. And so he was a professional development guy. But anyway, he's like, I told him what I wanted to do. And he said, okay, well, here, let's let's figure out what school you want to go to. So I got my degrees in leadership and development, master's in strategic. And then he connected me with some incredible CEOs that were prior military that built incredible companies. And so they became... Oh, there's a network. Oh, yeah. So they became my mentors. Mm -hmm. For all the guys still in. If, yeah. yeah. If you, if some of these guys, one guy was, you know, he was a, you know, he was a an Apache pilot and started an incredible company, several others, right? And during this process as you know, I meant them and it was more like just to pick their brain. But then, you know, I realized I'm like, no, I'm gonna ask them to be my mentor. This is before I went to the Honor Foundation. So they became my mentors. And then they're like, I would recommend this school and I would recommend this. And I didn't do it to get the certification. What I did was to be able to transfer all the things that I learned in the military and then be able to transfer into the civilian sector. So when I went through, like I'm, you know, I'm a certified project manager, Lean Six Sigma Black Belt. I mean, you know, project, all of these things, right? But what I did was I, as I was going through these schools, I realized, oh, we do that. Like I'm a, I'm a scrub, agile scrub man, all that stuff, right? But I, but the reason why I did that was to really kind of understand organizational speak. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing through that process and these guys were phenomenal. I mean, I, I had like a 45 minute conversation with, you know, Martin Gold, you know, Goldsmith. You know, who's one mm -hmm. of the, I mean, this is, these are the people that my, my uncle knew. And so then the Honor Foundation presented itself. And at this point I realized I was getting out. Mm -hmm. So I went to the Honor Foundation, which was phenomenal and uh, crushed that class. And then that built another entire network. And then I was getting ready to get out. And I think I would say I was about a year out and I had multiple opportunities. I mean. What was interesting is when I was going through the Honor Foundation, you know, they build out your resume and they do all these things. So what I did was I sent those to all the mentors. They all looked at them and they said, hey, let's let's get on a Zoom call. Those all turned into job opportunities. That's awesome. Which was, I was like, okay, so I'm set there. Then Brent and I started talking and started having a conversation. And the difference between a lot of those other entities was Brent's like, you can run everything that you wanna do. You can do, you know, you'll be my, VP of programs, but you can also do keynote speaking. You can also do this, you can do that, you can do that. So everything that I wanted to do and everything that I, you know, that my master's degrees and all of these things, it gave me the opportunity to utilize them all. And so as I was going through this process, I think the hardest thing I had to do was go back to those other individuals 
and say thank you, but no thank you. for the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I'm going to go this route, and they were totally fine, and we're still great friends now, and we still bounce things off one another. It's actually better that you go in and do that, as yes. opposed to just leaving it blank. Right. And so from there, for anybody yeah, listening. I know you, it seems easier and you would think that, right? Mm -hmm. but I mean, take the time. So there's a lot of people that didn't do it, right? And I saw that. And so now I'm mentoring a lot of guys that are getting out, you know, and then if you go on, uh, if you go on my LinkedIn page, I wrote, you know, kind of some of the things that I learned on the way out. And it's really kind of, you know, some steps on the things that I did in it. That's been helping a lot of guys. I've had a lot of Zoom calls, helping a lot of guys through, you know, their transition coming out of the military. Uh, and so for me, it's like kind of giving back. I'm working with the Honor Foundation. I'll be doing a couple events for them coming up. Um, and so, and our, you know, we're trying to get Taking Point Leadership. You know, we kind of partnered. We talked to Punky and several other guys. So, you know, we're going to be doing some stuff with them. Um, but it, it's been great. I mean, the company is phenomenal. It's a little bit different. I mean, we do long leadership programs. We're talking 10 months, 12 month programs. With Taking Leadership? Yeah, with Taking Point Leadership, which is the company that I am now. And Brent is phenomenal. He's written a couple books that have done incredible, you know, and, and you know, the companies that we work with are very high caliber organizations. Mm -hmm. And they really, really want to change. And I think one of the things that our company has been really good at, we've never had an organization stop in the middle. They've always wanted to do more stuff after the fact. Mm -hmm. And so we have several companies that continue. We've worked with one of the companies for like six years, seven years. If you could tell the guys that are in right now that are worried about getting out, I was just talking yeah. to some of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that they're worried, hey, the transition, if you can give them some advice, like, hey, what, worry about this, don't worry about that. Just what, I, what I would tell guys is your value is 10 times what you think it is. Mm -hmm. Because organizations, just for me working with a lot of organizations, um, the reason why we're, we're doing what we're doing is because there's, there's a lot of gaps in leadership in big companies and big organizations. And not only that, you have a lot of up and coming organizations too that are growing so rapidly and they're not able to do, oh, sure, yeah, get that. right? Because they're young. CEOs yeah. are young. They need a lot. You know, we do a lot of executive coaching now as well within our organization. So, you know, we're doing some coaching with some, you know, high level CEOs and senior executives, um, you know, not just from the, you know, development programs that we do, but, you know, we're able to kind of, you know, get a lot of leadership development from that standpoint. And so, you know, you learn from them and the more you work with CEOs and senior executives, the more knowledge that you gain, right? And so again, what I would say is, you know, get yourself smart on organizational speak is what I like to call it mm -hmm. because what you'll realize is everything we do in the military, they do That's right. yeah, in the that, civilian yeah. sector, but we do it way better. Yeah. We just don't know the terminology and we really don't understand you know, the difference, right? But once you start going to these certifications, which by the way, the military pays for, mm -hmm. the Navy Cool program will pay for all of those certifications. So you can go through the Navy Cool, you can get, you know, human resources, you can get project management, you can get Lean Six Sigma, and the military pays for all that, mm -hmm. right? And then, of course, you can get your education, your bachelor's degree, your master's degree through the military, they pay for it. If you can do it while you're in, which is what I did, so I did it through, you know, I did TA, tuition assistance. And then I gave my wife, you know, and she got her master's through uh, whatever. I heard something the other day that was like, hey man, the Navy, Navy's gonna work you or you can work the Navy. So and what I did the can... last four years is I took advantage of everything the Navy right. had to offer. And that's a, you can do that. It's, yes. That's what it's there for. I mean, you work hard, it's just a regular life, but you can right. also get everything out of it too. And what I will tell guys is, is it's, it's, it's not difficult and it's attainable. You just have to take the first step. Once it becomes part of your battle rhythm, it's easy because right now you can get degrees, masters, whatever, military pays for it. You can get it anywhere in the world, yeah. Yeah. right? And there's organizations and colleges that are out there that are gonna work with you. I mean, we had people that were deployed. Yeah. We had people on ships. We had people yeah. everywhere. Yeah. I remember guys studying in school in the middle, middle of combat. Right, absolutely. And so when somebody says- They got them through combat. Things, yeah. They're more worried about a test they had to take. We were <laughs> laid up in a building getting shot at. The guy's over there studying something. Oh my yeah. gosh. But again, that's also that mental fortitude, right? You really have to kind of, but again, once it becomes part of your battle rhythm, it comes very easy. So I would say is get out there, you know, 
learn that organizational speak, realize what you have to offer. I think what was even, to be honest with you, what's even more interesting is, is when you go through these programs, and what I found you know, just fascinating is you have O5s and O6s that are like, I don't know what I want to do when I get out of the military. Mm-hmm. And to me, I'm yeah. like, you are way behind the power. That'd be scary. If I was that's scary. scary. That's, that's but I think yeah. once they get out there and they start doing it, but I mean, the, the more that you can educate yourself on how big organization works and, you know, getting a great mentor. I mean, Brent Gleason is one of the greatest mentors I've ever had from a standpoint because he's just, he's got a lot of knowledge because he's ran multiple companies. You know, he's built and sold organizations. And why he wrote his book was because he saw all the gaps because he owned a company and he worked with so many companies. And so he took the leadership fundamentals and his his book is phenomenal. And so learn organizational speak, but also never, I mean, what we've learned from the leadership fundamentals and how we organize and how we do things, they just don't have that in the private sector. So guys, even if you start out, and what I also will say is like negotiate 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 right because the reality is is you know if you're a senior senior leader within nsw and you go out there they're going to try to lowball you yeah so know your worth and then negotiate Mm -hmm. so like one of the things that i said was i said well hey what do you think my what do you think and you know he came in just exactly what i wanted so i was fine with that but you know, some people are going to be like, "Well, hey, what about this?" And I'm like, mm, "Yeah," and I'm like, "You're crazy, yeah. right?" So you can negotiate because the reality is, is you're going to move up in that company really, really fast because you just have that drive, you have that mindset. You're gonna, you're gonna see, but it's better to go in with open eyes than blinders, and then opening up those blinders as you move forward. Mm-hmm. So it's better to go in, you know, real, like, just like anything else. If you're going to do a mission, yeah. know your playing field. I guess. So how can people find, like, help you? What's a plug that you can give for the company? That so the great thing with? about, so so the company is called Taking Point Leadership. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a consulting firm. We work with incredible organizations. There's a couple books, which, I mean, you probably heard one is Taking Point Leadership. The other one is Embrace the Suck, which mm-hmm. is the other book that he wrote, which is also a great book. But we also have Taking Point Academy, which we just launched, which is uh, you get an actual certification in change leadership, which is phenomenal. Um, and there you get private coaching and some other things in there. We do a lot of things like that. But again, go to our website and then from there, just, just take a look at that. And I think, you know, it's very, the website is really easy. We just rebuilt the entire website. We just did a lot of rebranding. Um, and so the company itself is we have not only SEALs, we also have some Top Gun pilots. We have a lot of consultants that come in and we have just, like I said, we've, most of the organizations we work with, we consistently and continue to work you with. You like it? I, I like love it. it. You love it. So I think I found, like I said earlier, I found that calling when I was actually at at uh, SDVs, I found that calling of just really building, you know, taking people, not only building them professionally, but also personally. Yeah. You know, but being able to bring those two together. And so I really found that passion. And then, of course, going through that school and doing all those things, I mean, I just loved it. I and so now going into this, I mean, I, I do it because I love it. Mm-hmm. I mean, the reality is I, I don't have to work. I'm no, fine. No, yeah. But I, I do asking. it because I love the job. And it's just a different perspective now because now I'm working with people that understand that and they realize that leadership is so important in these big, huge, major companies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when you see these people and they're just hungry, for that and our organization is phenomenal and I build all the programs out. And that's the one thing we do differently. Our programs are built out, they're custom designed. So we get all of that information that these companies will do. So they do a lot of things that we get. We grab all of that, you know, uh, data that we get from them. And then I take all that data and we build out a custom. So it's it's designed for that organization Mm -hmm. specifically. And so that is what I think is is a lot different from a lot of the organizations that are out there. Well, we're so glad to hear that you're doing yeah. well, and it's good to see you. They yeah. moved out here to Texas too. Yes. Yeah. How's the family digging it? I told you it was hot in August and September. Well, you know, I it was, say, it was really I, interesting because because and, and this is when we talk about faith. So our move was completely faith led. You know, Val and I. You know, the the family is doing phenomenal. 
you know, my older boy, you know, he's still into MMA and boxing and doing a lot of that. We go to a UFC gym here locally. So they're doing great. You know, my daughter, Viana, if you guys haven't seen her singing. She's awesome. She is phenomenal. So she's she's incredible. So she is about ready to start. She just got um, a part in James and the Giant Peach, which she's going to be oh, doing. Fun. Um, and then the little one does gymnastics. But anyway, so when we decided to move here, which was interesting, you know, we put our house on the market right at the right time. And, you know, we prayed about it. And we knew we were coming to Texas. We just did nowhere. And it was funny because I got a phone call from you, got a phone call from Charlie. When I, I was I was actually fasting and I was kind of like, where do I go in Texas? And then I get a phone call from you. And then like three hours later, I get a phone. And both of you guys are like, heard you're tired of coming to Texas. That's it. And I remember looking over at Val and I'm like, we're going to Houston. Oh my and gosh. so we started looking for houses here. And it was the same thing because we bought our house sight unseen, as you well know. Yeah. And we bought our car sight unseen. And so the people that we sold our house to in Texas were a faith-based family. The people here were a faith-based family. We took a less offer there. They took a less offer here. We closed on the 6th. We closed here on the 15th. So for 10 days, we're in a hotel. We're not sure. Didn't have a car because none of that had come to fruition because we'd given our cars to the church and to other people in Hawaii. And what was interesting is like, I thought, oh, it's going to be easy to get a car here. It was not. Huh. Mm. And we were literally in the hotel, and then a guy calls and was like, hey, I have a car you're looking for. You know, it's a 2019. We utilize it for here, but if you want it, you got to buy it right now. So Val's at the pool with the kids, and so I didn't even ask her. I just bought that car completely sight unseen. And then, yeah, we just we came in, and, you know, there's the house, and we stayed with you guys for a few days. And, yeah, but that was all just total. I mean, moving with six kids, or I'm sorry, with a family of six and a couple animals – easiest move ever My everything gosh. was completely smooth it was just totally led by the lord you just have you moved from hawaii Total in faith. june oh yeah so it was a little hot yeah, we're fine. <laughs> when we, you I get mean, here <laughs> we were totally fine yeah we love it here i mean we you know we're doing our, our pools almost done in the backyard that's we're building awesome our pool. we're doing a lot of stuff well good yeah well, thanks so for having you on. guys has been amazing yeah. and we got a good crew here now we do have a good crew it's phenomenal there's more and more people moving over here it's a lot of fun yeah so Okay. Anyhow, so that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at. So yeah. I've had an it's been an incredible 30 years, and I you know I love what I'm doing now, and that'll be incredible, and just love what I'm doing. Awesome. This is a fun family. part now. This is a fun it part. This is a fun part. This fun part. You know, and I get to work 85 percent from home. Mama homeschools, so it's a lot of time with the family. All the time. So it's good. That's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for coming down. We yeah. really appreciated this talk. And thank you, everybody, for listening in. We really appreciate you. Um, if you do have any suggestions on any guests that you'd like to see us do, please just hit us up on Instagram. You can go to team underscore never quit or comment on YouTube. Do whatever to do because we want to hear your suggestions. Um, that being said, we'll see you next week. This is the Team Never Quit Podcast. Podcast. Don't buckle up, buttercup. <laughs> <laughs>